The Visiting Artists Program, funded by PACA's graduate program, brings an outstanding roster of local, national, and international artists to PAFA each semester for lectures, critiques, and workshops. The program exposes students and the public to a range of artistic approaches and fosters discussion about contemporary art and ideas. This evening, we are pleased to have Anna Viscara Rankin joining us. AV makes art about maps, travel, and the general sense of being in and of the universe. Scale and materiality are her constant concern. She, she spends time in the, in the equilateral, sorry, as well as the polar sides of the binary, world maps with Antarctica at the top and dark circles filled with stars and surrounded by the ever developing horizon. A graduate of the Pennsylvania Academy for the Fine Arts and Temple University, Ranka lives and works mostly in Philadelphia. She has exhibited extensively, including at Philomoca in Pennsylvania, Rowan University Art Gallery in New Jersey, the gallery at Instituto Cervantes in Illinois, and Bickett Gallery in North Carolina. Rankin's work is held in numerous private and public collections, including at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, Brandywine River Museum of Art, Uruguay Cultural Foundation for the Arts, Peoria Riverfront Museum, Brooklyn Art Library, and Print Council of Australia. So please give a warm welcome to AV as she begins to share our screen with us and share her presentation. Hello, hello everyone. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces in this um, very um, new form of communication that we're all sharing. Uh, we're all little heads in little boxes and little screens. Um, thank you for coming. Um, my lecture today is going to be about um, how uh, my identity as an other uh, has affected my um, time in the art community. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different maybe from uh, a lot of these uh, visiting artist talks that I often do I usually like to talk about science and, uh, and math and travel. And I'm gonna talk about all those things today, but I'm also going to talk about um, other things like um, the role of bias and, uh, and, uh, and color and privilege, uh, which I don't usually like to talk about. So, I'm going to start with this map, um, which I think is, is kind of where it all began for me. This map is by Joaquin Torres Garcia. Uh, he's a Uruguayan artist. Um, and uh, he made the drawing that I'm posting next to over here um, in, uh, in the early 20th century, 1930s, I believe. Oh, and it's, it's just a little drawing and an eight by 10 piece of notebook paper. Um, so folks are usually quite surprised when they see it in real life. Um, here at the MoMA, they blew it up into, that was the, um, the introductory vinyl, you know, that you see before you go into a museum exhibition. So it was quite large and satisfying and about the same size as uh, this, portion of my world map that I made in his honor. Um, when I made this map, this was the, the second map. Um, well, no, it wasn't the second map, but it was um, the second very readable map that I made in this series. I was thinking about um, our ancestry as, um, as people that came to this continent. Um, I'm from Uruguay and most people in Uruguay immigrated um, from Europe at some point. Um, 
and that the native population was massacred in, in 1812 uh, by the Spanish. So there's been a complete erasure of, of uh, Native American culture. And uh, I think, you know, part of what Joaquin Torres Garcia was trying to do when he made his South American map was to reclaim the way that we saw ourselves. Um, but it was quite problematic because he was also, you know, a European immigrant um, as we are all. So his role as a constructivist in attempting to construct a new reality is something that has really carried over for me in, in my own practice. Um, this map, you know, has been completely cleaned off of any information. It's been whitewashed, you could say. Um, the only information is, uh, is this ship that is about to land. Um, the star is where Uruguay is, and these coordinates are where Uruguay is located. I feel like it's an oddly happy map in spite of what it says. Um, and, uh, and in some ways it's similar to the very first map that I made in this series um, called Global Optimization Diagram. And this is the one that's in the PAFA collection, which I've always kind of explained as being a map about how far and wide my family has traveled. Uh, but in light of current events, I think it's worth mentioning that um, a lot of where I was coming from with this had to do with, uh, with this idea of otherness and, um, and violence and the violence that we can perpetrate upon the other. Um, this is called Global Optimization Diagram. You can see at the very bottom, it says El Norte. Um, this one at the very bottom says El Sur. Well, no, this one does not have anything at the bottom. Um, let's see here. Oh, yep. Um, and this is something that needs to be said. Um, I stand with Black Lives Matter. That sounds really good. Um, defund police is a little bit more um, provocative, but I think equally as important. Um, So global optimization map, uh, diagram is, uh, I believe, an algorithm um, as an acronym. It's, it's quite nice, too. Um, these maps um, document a lot of different things. This is one of the only, one, only maps that I have been uh, very open about what it's about, um, extraordinary rendition. Um, extraordinary rendition is the government sponsored abduction and extrajudicial transfer of a person from one country to another with the purpose of circumventing the former country's laws of interrogation, detention, and torture. So this a map shows in red all the countries that have participated in this program, which was led by our uh, uh, United States intelligence agencies. Um, this particular uh, map was generated in 2013. In 2018, Amnesty International released um, updated data and the map had really not changed very much at all. Um, what I found very interesting and uplifting about this map was to see that South America is gray. They will not participate in this program because of everything that 
happened in the late 20th century with all of the dictatorships that were formed there. We are in a really difficult moment, I think, globally right now. And, uh, and like I said, I usually like to talk about science and I'm, I'm going to talk about that some more. But I think it's really important to remember that um, all of these structures have been put in place by people like us. And it is people like us that can dismantle them and that can reconstruct them and can create a new reality. Um, I think at the root, that is what Joaquin Torres Garcia was attempting to do. I think at the root, that is what a lot of artists are trying to do. And some of us make art that is more socially conscious and more activist than others. Um, some of us have topics that we really like to push forward with, you know, as agendas. Um, I have always tried to remain apolitical as an artist. I think that it's very important to do so. But as a person of color and as an immigrant, the current political climate has taken me from someone that was mostly happy to be accepted as someone that seems more or less like a white heteronormative type. Um, but I think it's become really important to come out, to come out of the closet as whatever you are. Um, I wrote myself a little note here. It says, um, let's see, where is it? Because I want to say this very specifically. Uh, here are my pigeonholes. Check off these boxes. Um, I am a queer Latin, half Jew, half Catholic woman, mother of color. And is of color even necessary to bring up at that point? Right? I mean, and I, I have colors, like I have tattoos. Um, right. So this informs all the artwork that I make. Um, I think wherever people are, it informs the artwork that they make. And, and that's, that's fine, but it shouldn't be the only thing that people talk about when an artist is a, a non white, non-male artist. I don't want to be a woman artist. I want to be an artist. I don't want to be a social activism artist. I want to be an artist. Um, but there are things like extraordinary rendition still happening right now. Um, we have kids in cages that are being called Hispanic or Latin, but most of them are actually Native Americans that are fleeing they're Native South Americans and Central Americans that are fleeing from uh, imperial structures that we have put in place. And, uh, and it may not be up to me because I'm not, I'm a terrible politician. Um, I suck at lying. The best things I can talk about are things that I am passionate about and that I've done research about. Um, but it's really worth bringing up um, that what people are doing right now, uh, peacefully protesting and, uh, and attempting to restructure the way that our reality uh, polices itself and the way that our communities um, function is really, really important. And if not now, then when? I mean, we are truly at the brink of a paradigm shift and I think we're all feeling it. Um, this is one of my maps from before COVID. Um, and, uh, and, and here moving back into, I think, slightly safer territory for me personally. Um, you know, I, I have always traveled a lot until now. Uh, the last few months have been the first time in decades that I haven't flown for months at a time. And as someone that's really concerned with the environment, um, you know, flying, flying is problematic. Um, 
And yet, I, I love it. I love getting from one place to another. And, um, and I really, I loved this map when I made it. It's a, it's a small collage um, that I made by doing screen captures of all the planes that were um, in the air at, at a, I think it was like a Tuesday at one in the afternoon. Um, so I made this map. I took some artistic liberties um, where there are some planes where planes will not be in. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I gave Antarctica pride of place. Um, and there's a lot of information that's, that's missing as well. Um, and that's a big part of, of what interests me in terms of art making is what information am I going to be generous with and, and give you to, to create an entry point and what information am I going to give to myself so that you can fill in those blanks. Um, this is um, another world map uh, with the south at the top. And, uh, and it's showing the sea surface temperature changes in the ocean for the last, um, it, it rolls up per decade. So each year it shows you what has changed in the last 10 years. Um, this one the, that I used for reference was from, I believe, 2016. Um, here is a slightly more recent one that's showing a, a lot more melting. Um, that's the blue shows colder surface temperatures. Um, the one that I was referencing still had the um, atomic uh, plant meltdown from Fukushima that was creating this red plume right here. And, uh, and there's some schmutz here representing the oil spill um, that had happened at that time, ExxonMobil, that um, the Gulf Coast is still experiencing, um, you know, die-offs of, of ocean uh, flora and fauna due to that. So while I don't spend a whole lot of time looking at what we're doing as humans to other humans, and, uh, and I have really just been incredibly incensed lately at, at having to spend time there. Um, I have chosen to plant my flag in the realm of the environment and, and what is happening to our planet. And I am, I think, pretty comfortable as a, as a pro-nature uh, artist. I, I don't think it puts me in the minority as far as artists are concerned. I think most of us have those concerns. Um, but like I said, up until recently, this was a subject that, I, you know, I'd, I'd want to talk to you about the kind of canvas that I used and the kind of pigments that I used. And, uh, and I think it's, it's time to start talking about other things as well um, in general. Um, so um, this map I just threw together for a talk a couple of months ago that I did about the environment. Um, and I, I'm probably gonna paint from this. This is a wishful thinking map. This is how much tree cover we need to reverse global warming. Um, it's very doable, we can all plant trees. Um, I, I love this map, it was generated by um, a research lab, I believe, in, uh, excuse the motorcycles, um, in, I wanna say Switzerland, I have it written down somewhere. I, I should do better than this. Um, and uh, I really like how there's this kind of eyeball here in Africa. Um, but uh, this map is using um, false color to visualize data that is not, like if you saw a satellite image, it wouldn't, the forest wouldn't look green, 
right? This all makes a lot of sense when you look at it this way. Um, the forests are blue, and then the less trees there are, the more yellow it is. So the, the color in this map, the gray, the Sahara is, is not gray, right? It's, it's a, a tool that we're using to map something that we are trying to envision. Um, and it's the same sort of technology that we're using to create these images of outer space. Um, so a lot of folks that are into sci-fi and that like astronomy, look at these images and think of them as photographs. Well, I still think of them as maps. Um, these images are documenting data that is often outside of the visible spectrum. Um, so something like this, like Western Lund, um, is a multi-channel uh, capture of things such as hydrogen and nitrogen, um, sulfur, uh, x-rays, radio waves. Um, well, it looks like we're being graced with motorcycles. I apologize. Um, all these things. I'm actually going to talk about that in just a little bit too. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale. So these, these guys, these paintings are, are quite small. I'm going to, uh, towards the end of my lecture, I will show you some, some of them inhabiting my studio space. They're about yay big, right? These guys are a little bit bigger, maybe this big. And they are light years large, right? So light years is a measure of distance. They are, I, I can't even wrap my brain around how large these spaces are that are being mapped. And, and here we are um, in a, a little graphic that I made. Um, where you can see the whole sky. These are my star maps. And then, you know, you have this, this little cutout of the sky and then this rosette nebula would be that small. So it would be, some of these images are the size of your pinky nail if you were looking at the sky and you just held your hand out like this. Let's see if I can fit the whole thing. And it would be the size of your pinky nail and you have these telescopes that are capturing this image and they're translating it. In this case, this is from uh, an amateur astronomer that works out of California. Um, and they are, they're creating these images and he uses a lot of hydrogen um, alpha. So it's showing hydrogen and sulfur and uh, visible light. So it's, it's really wonky nerdy stuff. Um, it takes enormous amounts of gear to do it and time. And I'm just really glad that I have access to, to, this, um, to this data, right? So this data and uh, this data, it's, it's really amazing when you can open up your phone and have access to this cutting edge global or astronomical um, information. And then what I like to do is I like to try and, and make it human. So I do that by making objects that you can touch and that you can take with you. Um, in this case, in the case of the maps, you can fold them up and just stick them in a suitcase and, uh, and show them all over. Um, I've done I did a show in Mexico a couple of years ago that was about 2,000 square feet of space and I took all the artwork in a suitcase and, uh, and we covered almost all the walls. So migration, the terror of getting where you're going, um, this is all part of, of the work of, of what inspires the work that I'm doing. Um, so false color, hydrogen alpha, 
uh, the, yeah, these paintings, so these are done in oil or oil and panel. They're going to last a long time. Um, they're pretty. I like painting them. People like buying them. Um, I never thought I would be making um, posters out of them or prints, but um, due to demand, I ended up doing that. And, and thanks to that, I've been able to send these uh, dozens and dozens of them to people all over the place. And when, when this virus started, um, I just started sending them out to people that I figured needed them. And it's, they've, been, they've been a really great way to connect um, so it's good, you know, getting back to, to what I was talking about earlier, we all, you know, we all have our own ways of, of dealing with, with the violence and with the panic, um, of, of what we are surrounded with today. Um, and maybe, you know, you can't get out there and wear a mask and march, but um, but maybe you can send some mail out to your grandmother or your great aunt that's stuck somewhere in in an home and and could use something to brighten their day. Um, and uh, yeah, so stargazing. Um, so this this transition between maps. And, uh, and, and these other maps, these star maps, um, is one that <clears throat> the more of these talks I do, the more I'm, I'm learning how to, how to move from one to the other. So these maps, you know, I've, I've never flown and, and looked at the world in a way that I could see all the planets. I mean, all the, all the land masses, you, you know, we don't, we can't see that they're all mediated images that I'm working from. Um, the, the reference is, ha, has been in this case, you know, gathered by way of um, telescopes and, uh, and GPS positioning and, and it's all, you know, data that is not tangible, right? Um, and then you have stargazing and stargazing with the naked eye the perfect example um, of noise pollution you know you've got these folks exercising the right to ride a dirt bike which is awesome i love motorcycles uh, but they're super loud and uh and then at night you know all of us want to see where we're going so we create all this light pollution um, and, and it's, it's getting harder and harder to, to see the stars. Um, and it's something that as a kid, I really took for granted. And even as a teenager growing up in rural Oklahoma, I took for granted, we had dark skies. And then I now realize not only did we have dark skies, but I had, I, I grew up in a community regardless of affluence because we, I was not affluent growing up, but I felt safe going outside at night and looking at the stars. And I felt, you know, the kind of frisson of fear that you feel when, oh, you're out at night, you know, as a, as a kid and, and there's shadows, but it's, it's, it's that fear that is a, a safe fear that is um it's you know it's invigorating right i'm not scared that i'm gonna get shot i'm not scared that somebody is going to show up and put a bag over my head and disappear me into a plane and take me to sri lanka for questioning uh, that didn't come until later and and it came you know, I, I understood that I think a little bit as a, as a little kid because I grew up in a dictatorship and, and police brutality and military brutality to all citizens was just a matter of course, right? Um, 
And then, you know, we moved to Oklahoma and the, the violence there is different because they have Native American reservations and, and, uh, and it, it's very much an us and them situation, but you can still get out in the, in the countryside and look at the stars and feel, you know, at peace with your environment. And I think that's becoming more and more rare for everyone these days. Um, whether you live in a city and you have an extraordinary amount of light pollution, or you live in a community where you don't feel safe. Um, so I think that's also what people are calling for, is for a return to a community that feels served and protected as opposed to a community that feels terrorized by those who are supposed to be um, our protectors. Um, up until the last few years, um, I, I loved that I could be all of these minorities in one and, and feel like I was part of, of this wonderful, vibrant group of people, um, it's only been um, since this new paradigm shift um, with, the new, with this current administration that I have um, really faced, come face to face with somebody telling me that I did not belong in this country. Um, I'm a citizen. It took me years to go through all of the process of becoming an, a United States citizen. Um, and now here I am being made to feel as though I don't belong. So, so that's why I stand with Black Lives Matter and why I believe that the movement of defunding police is a really important shift that we need to look at as a way to construct a new reality so that things like this map that we're looking at now can continue to happen. Um, so I, I mapped this out um, by hand in the dark with my sketchbook. It was beautiful. Um, one of the students that I talked to today said she was, she spent some time in Umbria. Um, this was in Umbria, which is kind of the, the middle of the boot in Italy. Um, so you've got, you know, enough mountains that you can see the, the stars and then um, the rest of it I mapped. Um, in a beach in Greece, and these are very old communities um, that are that are very much embedded in their sense of place, um, and yet I felt very welcome there, and and I didn't feel like a tourist. I felt like I was welcomed into this community, um, and I I think we have a lot to learn from these um, well-established. Um, you know, semi-rural areas um, where people help each other. And, uh, and, and I think we're, we're returning to that whether we want to or not because of this pandemic. Uh, much to my surprise, when I got back to the United States um, and I started doing research, trying to kind of flesh out some of these areas in this map, I found out that uh, another stargazer had made almost the exactly same map um, in 1695. Um, his name is Vincenzo Maria Coronelli. He was a Venetian uh, map maker and he drafted out this map that was just like mine because he was hanging out in a lot of the same places that I was around the same time of year. And, uh, and there's just, so much magic to realizing that you're looking at the same stars that somebody looked at, you know, 400 years ago, 300 years ago, um, and they're still there. And, and it reminds you just how infinitesimal we are, how precious life is on this planet, and how much we need to just get past our differences and start communicating with each other and saying things that we don't like to hear so we can just move forward as a species and, and evolve and evolve into a species that's worthy of conquering 
of not conquering, of, of exploring and, and trying to become part of, of the greater universe, right, that's around us. Um, these two images, this is from um, the studio in, um, in Italy that I was in. And uh, th so this is from 2015. I'm still working on these maps. This one was the, the previous one, um, this one. And then this one is one that I'm working on right now um, that I was planning to show you that's up on my wall right now. And I recently dipped it in the South Carolina ocean. Um, salt water has a tendency to tighten cotton fi fibers. I found out from another student I was with today um, about uh, cotton um, destroying the waterways in South Carolina that um, I didn't realize that that was something that was happening. So it made, I think, this interaction that I had with this uh, raw cotton canvas and the South Carolina Atlantic a little more poignant even for me. Um, I was very particular to be using pigments that weren't going to bleed into the water. So um, I was using these, um, you know, um, black ink that is made, um, folks don't necessarily know that a, a lot of ink is made from burnt um, animal bones. Um, and, uh, and it's quite uh, powerful, but, but also it really, really sticks. Um, and so after I brined this, the canvas became very nice and, uh, and a lot tighter and, uh, and it was covered in sand. And so I've been using the sand to add texture to this piece. Um, the magical forest. <laughs> uh, doo -doo -doo. Aha, ah, there was one more, um, one more pigeonhole and label that I wanted to talk about today. Um, I wanted to share that I, I, one of the first labels that I ever identified with was as a goth because I find comfort in darkness. Um, and um, it's, it was nice to like be able to embrace my otherness because when I moved to the States, I thought I was a white person. I never realized I wasn't. Um, I still don't know that I'm not, but it was, it was the sense of otherness that I hadn't realized I was until I moved to this country. And then later on when I realized I was going to be staying, um, to qualify myself as a goth was a way of kind of embracing the otherness and saying, this is another that I am, I'm choosing to be. Um, and I think I, I identified as a goth, I think just a little bit sooner than I identified as queer. Um, and certainly it took many more years for me to, um, well, for it to become legal for me to get all the tattoos that I now have and uh, to become a mother and to become all of these other things. Um, that each of us is becoming in our journey because if we are unchanging, then that gives us no room to grow. So it's kind of nice that after all this time, I'm still making art that I think is, it feels true to my gothness. I'm making giant black paintings <laughs> of the night sky and it feels really, it feels really good to do that. Um, um, here's an image of uh, my previous studio and I'm going to stop sharing here and let's see if I can uh, speak or view, see what I'm doing here. All right. Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of scale, which is something that if I was doing this talk um, at a podium, um, I wouldn't be able to do. So it's kind of exciting that I have you here in my space with me. Um, so I wanted to show you, these are some of the small um, astronomy paintings. Now, the camera on this laptop is not the best and 
I can't screen share from my iPad. So this is what you get. Um, so you can kind of see, see how big it is. There's my hand. The, this one is called Cat's Paw Nebula for obvious reason, reasons. This is a, a new one um, that I'm working on right now. Let's see, I've lost the view of myself. Um, this one's brand new and it's, um, oh, let's see here. Choo, 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 choo. Here we are, aha, okay. Um, and uh, I've been working with oil for many years now, um, but I, I recently had a, a baby two years ago. She's a toddler now. <laughs> um, but that makes it really hard to work in oils because oils are, they just kind of get into everything and they're hard to clean. And if your kid gets them, they could eat them. So I went back to acrylic and I'm, I'm kind of enjoying the acrylic, but I miss the oils. I think the oils are, are gonna be coming back very soon. But as you can see, these are quite small. People often think that these are the big ones and, and they're not. Um, the big ones are, are these star maps right here. This is the one that I did in Ecuador. Um, what I, well, I was at a, a Latin residency there. I didn't get to talk about the violence of the word Latin and Hispanic. Maybe I did a little bit. See, I'm not very good at talking about social issues. I like to talk about science and making things. Um, this is the one that I'm working on right now that I started in South Carolina. You can see some of the details there. Um, so this space um, was a space where they're trying to conserve turtles. Um, so all of these incredible mansions um, have to turn off their lights every, every night. Um, and we happened to be there right around the time that the Milky Way was peeking over the horizon. Um, so it was a really important time for the turtles to migrate. Um, and uh, it, was, it was cloudy a lot while I was there. So I had to really use the, the apps to get um, the, the positioning of the stars, but they're moving, it, this piece is moving right along, it's brand new. And then this piece um, is the one that I started while I was at a Brandywine River Museum. And it's finally, finally starting to come together. There was a full moon. I finally found some good reference material to work from. Um, so I'm starting to get the stars in the right place, just like I thought they were, but it's nice to get confirmation. Um, so this piece I've been working on for three years now. Um, and finally, um, these are two, I'm gonna see if this works, I don't know. These are two, no, oh wow, this is really hard. Ha! Um, these are two world maps that I just finished right before the pandemic hit. And they're called Red Flags. And this one is about global travel and it's documenting um, human travel, uh, livestock travel and agricultural goods. Um, and this one, I don't even have proper photographs of these guys yet. Let's see, can I get this to work? Aha! You can barely see, if you go on my Instagram, you'll be able to see more images of this guy. This is all the aerosols that are currently present in the atmosphere. And uh, if you're having a really bad allergy season, it may be because of the Saharan plume. Um, that has been buffeting us this year. And I was, I'm such a nerd. <laughs> I have been tracking this for, for ages and uh, I finally was like, oh man, this is gonna be a bad one with this um, Saharan plume. And sure enough, it, it was. So um, that concludes my little tour around the art studio. I'm so glad um, you joined me today. And, um, and I guess now we're gonna open up the room for questions. Yes, uh, thank you, A.V., this is awesome. And thanks for everyone who was uh, able to join us tonight. 
Um, so if you have any questions for Ana Viscara Rankin, you can put them in the chat at this time. And then um, I'll be reading them. It looks like we had a question from earlier. Um, <clears throat> Give me one moment here. It looks like Sarah asked earlier, at what age did you move to Oklahoma from Uruguay? Um, right before I turned 12. So I was uh, almost almost 12. Um, and uh, I started sixth grade in Oklahoma. Okay. So it was, it was quite the culture shock because the town that I grew up in in Uruguay was a seaside town. So it was a very progressive, um, after the dictatorship ended, you know, very liberal place. Um, and then we, and with the ocean, with beautiful ocean and, and just beautiful landscape. And I went from living there to living in Oklahoma, which is, um, you know, it's a place that has a really problematic history. It's, it's somewhat desertic and flat. Um, you are very, very far away from the ocean. Um, and, uh, and the folks there are, are quite um, conservative. Um, so it, it really just was so incredible to go from feeling like I was one with my environment to this like sense of otherness um, that was so pervasive. Um, and it's, it definitely shaped who I am. Thank you for answering that. And then we have a question from Jill. Um, and I noticed her question kind of ties into my own personal question. So I'll kind of tag at the end of this, if that's okay with Jill. She wrote, I love how you exposed the star map painting to the ocean in South Carolina. Have you exposed other pieces to the elements? Do you often include natural materials like sand in your work? And then um, to add on to that, um, I was kind of, um, wondering about the materiality in my own head as well and it, its connection to your new ideas, um, your new maybe like unfam unfamiliar ideas as you kind of shared that you're um, learning how to talk about them and, and how to express them in a way that feels comfortable to you. Mm -hmm. So I wonder um, through your discussion about like about balance of uh, of how you want to identify as an artist, um, whether it be apolitical or political. Um, how, how is the way that you treat your uh, materials evident in that? To me, it like reflects some sort of humanistic quality that you have a relationship with. And then I was just wondering, are these indefinitely malleable? Are they always changing? Or do you, um, do you end them and finalize them? All right, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> so to answer Jill's questions, question first, um, yes, um, the piece, uh, the first piece that I ever dipped in the ocean was the one that I did in Ecuador. Um, I wish I had thought about it when I was in Greece, but also the materials that I was working with then were not, they were a little bit less fugitive, so I wouldn't have wanted to soil that ocean. Um, but in Ecuador, I was already working with organic materials that I felt um, that I had purchased there um, that were non-toxic. And, uh, and I, I felt like I was able to seal them really well into the canvas. Um, and so I have a short video of, of that, um, that time of going into the ocean with the painting. And I loved what it did to the to the material, to the canvas. Um, the reason I decided to do a, to brine it at that point was because we had all this beautiful pigment that uh, one of the artists there had brought from Chile. So we wanted to use that pigment and the only way to get it to stick was like, if we needed to use boiling water and or salt. And it was impossible to like generate enough boiling water to dip the entire painting. So we decided to brine it in salt and then heat the whole painting with the pigment as much as we could um, by exposing it um, to the sunshine in like a bucket um, <laughs> with the pigment. 
and it worked. Uh, the color that we ended up with is is this this color. This is probably like the most colorful of my star maps. Um, so the the blue color that you see at the edge was what we um, what we were able to dip the piece in after brining it in the ocean. And now this piece also has rice and it has uh, mate, which is a type of tea. And it has um, some leaves, which I wanted to um, have them echo plantain leaves because there's, a, a, so in short, yes. Um, I do like to expose the artwork to um, the natural environment and I like to use organic materials to work with um, that are evocative of the, the theme. Um, but I also don't like to get too cute with it. And, you know, like you can't, I, I feel like it's too on the nose if you make each of your, okay, this painting was in South Carolina, I'm gonna use South Carolinian sand. And um, I feel like you have to give yourself a little bit poetic license um, to not, not have to like check all the boxes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then as to what you were talking about, and I think Je uh, Jen, you were referring to um, how materiality intersects with my renewed sense of social commitment. Is mm -hmm. that kind of what you were going for? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's always been there. Like I, I feel like, like the only thing that has materially changed for me is my willingness to talk about this. It was inculcated very strongly within me very early on that you don't talk about politics or religion. And I have really held on to that belief. Um, I don't, I feel super uncomfortable talking about it. Um, but I have gone from somebody that can just kind of exist with this um, turmoil within, you know, like um, after I marched in pride parades, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, I'm good. Like people that know me know who I am. They know my belief systems. They know my politics. I, I don't want to talk about it to strangers. I'm not a politician. I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. But we have arrived at a point where silence can be deleterial to what people will, will assume, you know? Um, so I think it's time at least for me to um, share, to, to clarify some of my points of view so that they don't get misinterpreted and misused, um, which, you know, can, can be the case if you're, if you're making artwork, um, people, people can use it in ways that maybe you don't approve of. But, but in terms of, you know, the materiality and, and the foundation of my practice, all of this has always been there. I'm always very particular about using materials that conform to the message that I am, you know, to the, not the message, because I honestly, like, I don't want to preach to any choirs, um, but to the vision, you know, that I'm trying to bring into, to, cons to bring into reality. Thank you for answering that and kind of opening up about it. I think it's super interesting to hear. It's and super hard. Thank you for <laughs> bearing with me. I know some folks maybe were like, God, she's gone off, you know, the left field. I didn't even get to talk about language and how we say, oh, this went south. Hey, how is that a bad thing? Let's change that bit of language and say, hey, this went sideways. Mm -hmm. And you know, I could have really like skidded off left field. That's a baseball thing, I think. Um, but I, I think hopefully we kind of kept it together. Hope so. Let me, um, this question kind of, uh, goes along with the idea too, coming from Patricia, Patricia sorry. Um, Patricia says, thank you, Anna, for courageously sharing your thoughts and feelings um, about injustice. Um, from your experience with dictatorship, 
what is the answer to reconciliation or the solution to polarization among the population? And then in parentheses, she writes, how do you think the crisis will be reflected in the future post-March 2019 work? So I guess you're- Those are the big questions, right? <laughs> Unknown, yeah. So <laughs> um, my one word answer is cultivating empathy. Um, I think we just need to look at things from, from the other, right? From the other point of view, like flip it. What if, what if you were the guy that's been riding around on a bike with a backpack full of people's food all day in 90 degree weather? and you got lost and were 10 minutes late and delivered cold food. Like, are you gonna be an a-hole about that? Come on, like, hmm, let's just try and, and, and remember that we're all in this planet together and, and try and keep our perspective open and practice empathy. And I'm an animist, so I kind of believe in practicing empathy with you know, whales and dolphins and pigs and ants and rocks because what are rock, what are stars are basically just giant burning rocks that are far, far away. Who are we to say they're not saint sentient, right? And now I'm really starting to, to, to go a little bit out there. No, I appreciate it. I think most of us do. <laughs> um, let's see here. It uh, looks like Kevin says, thank you for joining us. So if anyone has any more burning questions they want to ask, it's six o'clock now. So we'll kind of um, begin to wrap things up here. Um, and then it looks like we have a question about the recording, but we'll have that answered soon. It'll be published um, pretty soon here. If anyone has any last minute questions for AV, um, please put them in the chat. Oh, Dan. <laughs> Jen, is it okay if I just verbally articulate yeah. as opposed to type out? Um, Only Anna, for you, Kevin. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I figured uh, maybe I'll take chair privileges here at the programs, but uh, just want to, you know, again, second what I, you know, typed in the chat, just that it's great to uh, see how your work has developed since graduate school and obviously thinking that we have a lot of our graduate students in the uh, audience, you know, I'm kind of going back to some of the conversations we had in critiques when I think the maps and mapping your lineage and starting to kind of, you know, begin that process started to develop. And I mean, I'm just really thrilled at how things have, have developed for you. And I guess, you know, I'm curious, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about how your graduate school experience and how some of those seeds that were planted there start to sprout there how you were able to kind of cultivate the aspect of being able to kind of travel, do some of the residencies that you've done and the opportunities that you had and how you've been able to really build a career uh, after graduate school. Because I think sometimes, you know, we think you know, we get it all figured out in graduate school, but I think everyone has a slightly different journey. And I know, especially I think your last semester, things really started to get cooking for you. And, uh, you know, it's just, just amazing to see how more willing you are to, to, to start to talk about these things, because I know that that was hard at first and still is difficult, uh, but I think it's really important. I think, you know, you've shared a lot of really important insights and uh, uh, processes with your work and just your own development with your career. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, but I think that might be nice for our students to, to hear, to know that there is life after graduate school and that things, uh, thing, you, you, you find ways to build your career. Indeed. Yes. Um, it was really great to talk to uh, the low residency MFAs. I, I felt a really good sense of connection with everyone because I did. I came in as a, as a non-traditional student that already had um, a history as an artist. I, I, I had already, you know, sold plenty of artwork before I showed up at PAFA as an MFA. My background was in art history, so I, I didn't always feel like I was on the same path as some of the more traditional MFA students. Um, and it was really great to get to talk to this uh, new low residency program folks, because they all felt like like they were whole people that have you know interesting, complex lives, and yet 
they're managing to make art and they're managing to deepen their practice and they're doing so. I mean, everybody I looked at today had really, really strong bodies of work. So it, it was really nice to see that, that this is what's coming out of the program right now. Um, and that, you know, these are the folks that are, that are engaging, um, in, in dialogue right now. Um, you know, the MFA, it's a magical time. Um, it's arduous. I connected the most personally with the museum community while I was there. And I spent a lot of time at the museum um, working with the folks there, with Barbara especially, um, who, was, who was here earlier. I'm not sure if she's still here. And, uh, and they, they really were what forged the deeper connection for me. And I stayed um, and worked at the, at the museum for a few years afterwards. And it's still like the best job I've ever had. Um, they wanted me to spend more time at the museum, but thankfully around that time, my studio practice was also kind of starting to flesh out. So I, I had sort of had to make a bit of a choice and I took a, a sabbatical that's turned into, now it's been four years and I'm still, you know, full-time studio artist. Um, I think, I think if you, you have to bring your own something. You can't just come into an MFA program hoping that you will magically become whatever. Like it, you have to do the work. Um, and that's true of anything, really. Any endeavor worth doing, it, it takes some work. Um, it took me, I would say, a couple of years after the MFA to really kind of come into my like happy place of the new me, the new artwork that I was making. Um, and now I look at some of the work that I was making before I came in and, and I'm finally starting to revisit some of it. Like the, I, I still have, don't work with the figure after going to Papa and it wasn't because, um, of any negative thing. I just was like, blah, this is, I, this whole time I've been thinking I need to work with the figure and it turns out. I'm the figure. <laughs> and so my body became part of the artwork thanks to Mark Blavitt. And he was like, but what about you as the figure? Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a journey. And I think it's important to remember that when you finish your MFA, it's not really an ending. It's actually the beginning. Um, and you come out of there and you're just sort of like, what just happened? You know, now I owe all this money and I don't even know if art's worth making. And then you just keep making art. That's the important part. You got to keep making art when you get out. If you stop making art, it will have been for nothing. It will have all been for nothing. So if there is like one piece of advice that I can leave you with is as an MFA student, when you finish your MFA, keep making art. You can go join Habitat with Humanities and build houses, but take a sketchbook, draw about it. You can go do whatever it is that you feel like you missed out on doing for the last two years because you've been doing nothing but talking and making art but keep making art you know the nice thing is you don't have to talk about it anymore unless you want to and you will find if you're at all like me that after a year or two of hiding around in museum basements and traveling and i got to do yeah i got to do the italian residency and the ecuador's residency but it took me a couple of years to want to get back and actually like continue the dialogue because I, I, I had to know, you know, where I stood. So it's okay to feel a little bit lost. Just keep making art and it, you don't have to talk about it anymore. You can just keep making art and eventually maybe you'll want to talk about it some more. Um, and eventually maybe you'll figure out what you're doing or you won't, but just keep making it. It's okay. <laughs> Yes, keep making art. Paula's <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin, for asking that. Thanks, Anna, for, for answering that and inspiring us to keep going. <laughs> um, so if we are done with questions, it's 6.08 now, so we're a little bit over time. Um, 
I just want to say once again, thank you all for joining us. And it means a lot to us that we were able to have a great turnout, um, especially while we've had this program redirected to be on, on this online format. And thank you for your patience and Anna, especially for your adapting <laughs> during this all. Um, it's, it's super great. So this is going to conclude our program today. I'm gonna to stop our recording and um, you guys are free to leave this and we will see you again next Wednesday. All right, I'm gonna stop this. Thank Thanks you for having me. Thank